today. We are glad you could join us today as we hear from nurses about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. We will briefly hear from each of them and then take questions. Please note that VNA will be recording this event and will provide the recording to everyone in attendance. We will also provide a list of the nurses who have joined us as well as their location. And now I'd like to introduce VNA President Linda Shepard. Linda. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Janet said, my name is Linda Shepard. I'm president of the Virginia Nurses Association. And on behalf of the VNA and VNF, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today on a discussion about the ongoing crisis, which is, which is impacting nurses across the Commonwealth as well as across the nation. From the first wave of the pandemic to present, nurses have continued to leave the profession. According to a study published in April of this year, four in 10 nurses surveyed reported they have considered leaving the nursing profession as a consequence of the pandemic. Nurses feel disrespected by communities who initially hailed them as heroes, but now refuse to follow the simple steps that would ease their burden, like wearing masks and getting vaccinated. Our nurses are mentally depleted, exhausted and traumatized and experiencing pandemic related PTSD with little or no time to seek mental health services. Suicide among nurses and other members of the medical team is also on the rise. The international nursing shortage, which existed pre-pandemic has now been exacerbated, um, resulting in acute care bed closures due to lack of nurses to provide patient care. The fallout from this shortage is bleak as it continues to grow and impact healthcare and healthcare services. So this morning, in order to help us in understanding all of these concepts and perspectives, we have several individuals that will be sharing their stories and their vantage points. Um, and so I will now introduce those individuals. We have Ashley Fogelman, who is a relief charge nurse at Johnston Memorial Hospital in, um, in the emergency room in Abington, Virginia. We have Elise Harrison, who is a 23-year nurse veteran dedicated to the ICU arena. Raymond Lucini, who serves as the med surge dedicated unit for COVID and has volunteered to take care of COVID patients since the first wave. From the Virginia Hospital Center in Arlington, Virginia, we have Melody Dickerson, who is the senior vice president and CNO at Virginia Hospital Center. During the pandemic, Melody helped to set up the first drive-through COVID testing <clears throat> facility in the DC metro area. Melody is also the VNA chapter president for our Northern Virginia chapter. Sherry Hensini, I hope I pronounced that, pronounced that correctly, is one of the assistant patient care directors in the main ICU at Virginia Hospital Center. Sherry has been a nurse at BHC for over 35 years, most of that time within the ICU. We also have Dexter McDowell, who is a patient care director on 8B intermediate care for as a COVID dedicated unit. From the Central Virginia area, we have Ashley Apple, who is a pediatric nurse practitioner at KedMid Urgent Care in Midlothian and previously worked during the pandemic in the ED at VCU. And from Charlottesville and Abermoral area, we have Misha Jones, who is a member of the VNA board, president of the Piedmont VNA chapter and a practicing nurse. And so we're gonna begin going down our list of attendees and I'm gonna start with Ashley Fogelman and have her share some of her, her perspectives and personal stories from this pandemic. Ashley. Thanks, Linda. So I transferred to the ER in February of 2020 while I was still in nursing school. Um, so that was the beginning of COVID. And then I graduated nursing school May of 20 and took my boards June of 20. So I started all this in the midst of the pandemic. And I feel like things are so much different than last year. Um, we have less, less staff. The patients, I feel like, are much sicker from what I'm seeing in the ER. I don't know if they're waiting longer to come in or I, I just feel like the strain is just so much stronger than the other. Um, so essentially, I've been part of the ER since the beginning of the pandemic, and I've been able to see the waves and see the changes in all the staffing. Um, 
so right now we're, what we're experiencing in the ed is our ratios are so much higher our patients are so much cr more critical um for example last week when i worked i had three icu patients a pcu patient plus three or four ed patients all at once while charging um the and it's not just the ED that's experiencing this, the floors and the ICUs, they are just so much, just so overloaded with patients right now. The ratios are being increased every time I go to work. I feel like um, we're having to increase ratios just because we don't have the staff to take care of this patient load. And it's not like we can turn patients away. Um, so what we're seeing is with the increased ratios, we're not able to provide the individualized care that we expect to, that we strive to do as nurses. Um, I'm not able to spend the time with my patients and get to know them and do the assessments like I would prefer to. Um, I feel like it's mainly just passing medications, making sure these patients aren't dying and then going on to the next one. Um, and what we're seeing in the ED are long, long wait times, a lot of aggravated patients, aggravated family members and friends. Um, but the big thing with that is we've got so many ambulances coming in. Um, we don't have rooms for them. So usually they get sent straight to the front, to the waiting room to be assessed if they appear stable, if vitals appear stable. Um, and we've got a lot of like misconceptions in that I come in by ambulance. I expect to get a bed immediately. Um, so we're experiencing a lot of, I guess, not really anger, but some impatience from family members and patients. Um, we've got rooms, but we're holding patients for days, like 40, 50 hours, if not more. Um, and I just, I just want the public to know that if you are in the waiting room, chances are you're stable. Um, there's a reason why you didn't get a room immediately. And we just want you to be patient with us. I don't, when I go grab a patient or when I go to reassess a patient in the waiting room, those double doors open. And sometimes it's like an angry mob. They come to us. Um, they want to know why their parents or their kids not coming back immediately. And we just don't always have the answers for them. Um, but I feel like we're experiencing this all over Ballad and all over the country. And I just want people to realize that we're still working hard and we're trying to save other lives in the back. Just because it you can't see us doesn't mean that we're not working and doesn't mean that our coworkers aren't working as well. We're all tired. The Physicians are tired, management's tired, administration's tired. Um, and we're, we're here with these patients and their family members while they're making life-changing decisions um, that can impact not only just the patient, but anybody involved in their care. And we're just trying our hardest. And I just want everybody to realize, just be patient with us. Um, we go home after each shift stressed and tired um, but we still managed to come back the next day or our next shift and do it all over again. Thank you, Ashley. Really appreciate your perspective. All right, next I want to turn it over to Elise Harrison. Elise, good morning. Hello. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I have been uh, at Johnson Memorial since um, 1998 in the critical care unit and um, so I'm used to seeing very critical patients. I'm used to having patients die. Um, I, I love my job. I'm not burned out uh, or have compassion fatigue. I love my job. Um, you know, I'm 51 years old um, and I've been doing this a long time, but I still enjoy it. But I have never in all my career have seen patients so sick and, and lose so many patients. I've, this has been exhausting. And um, I'm trying to think of what can I do to make people in our community understand 
uh, that this is real, that um, these people are the sick, um, and to encourage our community to do what they need to do to help us out, to um, reduce the burden on us. Um, like what can I do to convince people to wear masks when they're going out? Because they do help. They're not 100%, but they help. Uh, to get the vaccine if they can, to protect their loved ones. Um, because I go out in my community and I see, everywhere I go, I see people still just acting like nothing's happening. And that is to me what I'm having a hard time with now, that it's been uh, a year and a half since this began and we have all these resources available to um, protect people and uh, prevent them from getting COVID-19, but it's not happening. We are at 41% vaccination rate right now. And I just felt like we were gonna be in a different place at this point. So, you know, I'm a little angry and frustrated because the people that we are getting now, uh, I'm like um, Ashley uh, Fogelman in that these people are way more sick and they are younger. And I, just the past few weeks, just um, Monday, I taking care of 40 and 50 year olds that are dying. They, no matter what we do for them, um, we get them, put them on the ventilator. We have to start sedation and we have to paralyze them in order for them to even their lungs to um, uh, respond to the ventilator and allow the ventilator to breathe for them. Um, we have to put them on their stomachs um, to put their lungs up. And even doing that, their oxygen saturation will be in the 70s and 80s. And these are people with their comorbidities are, you know, can be just some hypertension, overweight, and that's it. Like they don't have lung problems. And, but the single thing that is in common with all these people is they are not vaccinated. I have not cared for one person um, that this sick in our CCU that has been vaccinated. Ooh. I'm sorry, did I lose you guys? No, you were still no. there. Okay, it kicked me out. But so I guess if I say anything, it's just, I, we need our communities to help us out to decrease the burden. Um, we love caring for people. We want to get people better, but um, we can't always, and we are losing more people than saving uh, that get as bad as they are when they come to my critical care unit. And we can provide all the care that a large hospital can, except for maybe ECMO, and uh, continuous hemodialysis, we can provide everything else and we still are having trouble saving people. Um, and I mean, just, just Monday, I had a 40 something year old man, a big man, grip my hand and, and just, hold my hand and squeeze it so hard that it hurt and tell me how afraid he was. And we were about to intubate him. And my intensivist um, also held his hand. We tried to explain everything. He wanted to know how long he would be down. And Dr. Amarna says at least a week, probably two, maybe even three. I mean, what a scary thing to hear. This person has children and a wife. And so all I can do is just tell him that I'm gonna do the best I can do for him. And then we do that, we get him stabilized. And then I have to call his wife because she can't be there and, and explain to her on the phone. And she's crying the whole time and just try to comfort her and let her know what we're doing for her husband. And this is going on and on and on. And it is taxing and we are exhausted. 
but we're going to keep on doing it. But my final thing to say is that please, I wish my community would help us out and do what they need to do as well. Thank, thank you. you, Elise. Thanks. And thank you for being vulnerable with us. I know it's been difficult and it's been trying. Um, so, and just kudos to you and your team. Thank you. thank you. So now I'm going to turn it over to Raymond Lucini. So Raymond, you're up. Um, yes, my name is Raymond Lucini. Um, I've been a nurse here at JMH um, since May of 2019. Um, mainly working med surge or being pulled uh, maybe to ER to float or help out and do holds. Um, but, you know, back then the holds were not the same as they are now. Um, you know, COVID started, we did this, you know, March of 2020. And back then you had maybe two or three patients on your COVID unit. Um, you'd barely go in the room you could monitor them and you tried to keep your distance. Um, now we're overwhelmed. Um, all the floors are full. ER is taking mainly COVID exposure patients even, to where they can't get the patients in they need to, like Ashley has said. Um, you know, on med surge, we work closely with ER, with ICU, with progressive care, PCU. Um, we get patients from everywhere. You know, at least may have a patient that has gotten better and she sends them down to us, and yet we might send them back the next day. They just don't have a good recovery. Um, we get patients, and when they get in the hospital, their main worry is their family. You know, when are they going to see them again? Or I wish I could just go home. And it's very hard to explain that you're on oxygen that you cannot go home with, and you're stuck here with us until we get you better, hopefully. But knowing in the back of our head that they always usually get worse before they get better. Um, and we take that home to our families. I know other nurses do as well. It's not something you can just leave at work. You can't just clock out and be done. Um, but it's very, very tiring. Um, Cause you want to give the best care for your patients. You want to always be there with them if they need you. But realistically, one person can't take care of five emergencies or, you know, at the same time. Um, and it's just because they need that much help. They're struggling to breathe or they just are so concerned. They get anxious. They just need you there. And, you know, being a bedside nurse, that's what we're there for. We're there for them, but it's, it's getting harder and harder um, to go home and to have a sense of peace that you did what you, all you could do at the end of the day. So, um, you know, we keep on praying and hoping that, you know, the numbers die down and that people take care of themselves and that we can do better, and provide better care to what we have. And that's what I think every patient wants is to get better and go home to their families. That's all I got. So thank you, Raymond. I, and I'm just going to reflect because I work with these individuals and they are awesome nurses. Um, but just a couple of things in reflection. I know on the med surge unit, we have had incidents where we've had actually patients have passed away on the unit. And I ran into a nurse one day and she was crying profusely because she was so devastated by the loss of a patient. So I offered to take over for her and told her to go make sure that she was taking a break, take time to herself. And the nurse refused to do so. She said, then it, the other patients that know that I'm their nurse and that I'm, no, I'm responsible for taking care of them, she said, you know, that's my responsibility and I don't want them seeing someone else like I've given up on them. And so that is the heart to which the nurses take caring for their patients, but it comes at an expense also. We have had within our own system, we have had suicides of nurses and other healthcare professionals um, we have also had nurses that have said over the past, you know, six months, they have lost tremendous amounts of weight, being unable to really focus and being able to get themselves in a place where they're emotionally settled. So they've just kind of stopped eating. So all of these things are impacting all of our nurses here in Virginia, as well as across the nation and the world. And with that, I'm now gonna turn it over to the group from the Virginia Hospital Center. So next up is Ms. Uh, Melanie Dickerson. Melanie. Thank you, Linda. Um, 
you know, I'll say at, at Virginia Hospital Center, um, we are, um, you know, about 30% of where we were at our peak, which was uh, just um, around the first of the year. We've had four major waves in this area. And, um, you know, what I would like to say to everyone is, you know, I, I know that there's still a lot of um, controversy over uh, the masking and the vaccines. And, and you know, I would just uh, say to everyone on this call that um, we know these things work. We, we know they work because we've seen it with our own eyes. We've seen it with our employees. 90% of the nurses at Virginia Hospital Center are vaccinated. And we have not had a uh, patient to nurse transmission really since we all started wearing masks. The masks was the thing that just turned everything when everyone started wearing a mask. And it amazes me today as, you know, we start trying to move away from this, you know, we, we're all stuck, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, to, to really have nurses having confrontational conversations with the public about the simple request to wear a mask when you're in the hospital to visit a patient. It's so simple, yet the civility has somehow gone awry. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, we all became nurses because we want to give excellent care. The challenges that we're faced with right now are really a reused word, but a very appropriate, it's unprecedented right now what nurses are going through. Um, there's so much competition for the workforce that every organization is working without. And, you know, we're all spending every day, every shift trying to figure out how to move nurses from one area to another so that we have some semblance of safe staffing. And um, with all of this, uh, uh, additional burden that the nurses are going through, I would say, you know, we just need to be kind to one another. Uh, you know, get the, get the vaccine, wear the PPE, and just be kind to one another uh, in, in uh, you know, the environment that we're in today. Thank you, Melody. Really appreciate those words. Uh, and so, so true. Next, we're going to move to Sherry Harsanigi. I'm Sherry Harsani. Harsani, okay. Harsani. Thank you so much, and my apologies to you. You're that's fine. Um, so I'm Sherry Harsani. I'm the assistant patient care director in the ICU at Virginia Hospital Center. I've actually been an ICU nurse my whole career, so I've been one for 37 years, and I've worked in that unit almost 36 years. So came as a baby nurse up from Bluefield, West Virginia, Bluefield, Virginia, to Northern Virginia. So um, being just traveling down there yesterday, I, you know, I can't imagine what you all are going through with no ICU beds down there. Um, last week as the charge nurse, we were getting phone calls from family members in that area, just searching to try to find an ICU bed for their family member that was waiting for beds in southwestern Virginia, Tennessee, we were getting random phone calls from family members that are just panicking for to find a COVID bed for a loved one. But in our ICU, as Melody said, we're about 30% um, COVID, but all the frustration and the feelings of hopelessness still remains there. One nurse comes to my mind right now that last week, um, it has really affected her because she's had family members with COVID. Um, she actually had COVID herself before the vaccination, um, not hospital related, but she is, her affect is flat. She's depressed. We're trying her, our best, you know, to be positive, to help her through this. We've um, referred her to counseling for her physical and mental depletion of COVID. But I, my heart breaks because as Elise said, I love nursing myself. I love critical care nursing, but I'm worried about the generations before me that are going to lose their love of nursing because of this pandemic. And I actually um, have um, two of our nurses have reached out and professionally sought help for their um, 
um, PTSD from COVID. Um, they recognized it themselves and are undergoing um, help from the outside to be able to come to work. Um, you sit and talk to the nurses and and even I'll admit sometimes I had an angst that when you're off three days, you worry that night before you don't sleep, you might have restless of what am I walking into? Um, it was more so prevalent, you know, the first 12 months, but as we know, our hospital's a little different right now because we're in a area with a vaccination rate about 60 to 70% and the positivity rate in Arlington, I believe is around 4% Arlington County. So we're a little different demographics in that, but it doesn't take away our angst as we prepare ourselves for that first day coming back to work, what I'm going to face. So our challenge now in the unit is not all, are we facing the workload of the COVID patients, which is in my 37 years of nursing, I think I've never experienced um, this type of, um, I would say the donning, the doffing, you know, going into a room for three hours to intubate a patient. Um, you might have to change your scrubs three times a day because you sweat, you have sweated through your nursing uniform. You know, just the work intensity of trying to rescue and stabilize a COVID patient is intense. And then as Elise said, you go through your mind when you get home, what could I have done better to save that patient? Um, what could I have, how could I have changed those um, sedative drips to be able to ventilate him better. Every physician is going through that. Every nurse is going through that to be able to say, how could I give the best care? Because I want this patient to live. I don't want the COVID virus to win. So I think that's why we're all depleted is um, we, as Melody said, we all know that vaccination um, can help prevent, you know, and decrease the terrible cases and decrease the side effects. And I think it gives us a sense of powerlessness when we don't see people um, masking or um, taking the opportunity to get a vaccination. Um, and our next struggle, struggle right now in the ICU is um, all our regular patients, our um, surgery, our neurosurge, um, where those patients were delayed for routine surgeries are now coming in. So we faced your increased um, staffing or census from the COVID along with the increased surgeries that were held back um, are just our churn, our daily churn is taking a toll on the nurses. Their 12 hour day now is becoming into a 13, 13, 13 and a half hour day because you're charting after their end of your shift, you're trying to provide the best care that you can to make a difference, but you, you're you um, stepping through just to save that patient or be able to help get that patient to the next level. And along with being compassionate and kind to the patients and their family members, I think Melody did is, tr is right in the sense that we just need a little kindness and we just need not people to be so angry with us at times. And I know they're frustrated just as we are. I think my last statement would be, please be kind to a nurse and say thank you for the past 18 months. I think we've lost that. It, the media was very, um, nurses are heroes, um, but I think we've lost that right now at this point in time. And I. The one thing that I also reflect as a nurse, I think um, during the time of COVID, I am humbled with our nurses' bravery and courage. Couldn't be more proud to be a nurse at this time. Thank you, Shirley. We, we appreciate your vulnerability and we appreciate you sharing that with us. Excellent. Thank you. All right, next we're gonna move to Dexter, Dexter McDonald. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so my name is Dexter. I've been working as a nurse leader um, throughout the course of the entire pandemic. So um, dating back to March of last year, um, I spent some time working in DC at a um, hospital there. And then I just recently started working at Virginia Hospital Center back in February. Um, one thing I like to remind our community is um, prior to this pandemic um, nursing, we already had staffing challenges that we were facing. Um, but during that time, we were um, we were still up to the challenge, and then the pandemic came, um, and we really haven't had an end in sight just yet, but we're still up for the challenge. 
Um, but I want to remind people that um, we become these patients' family members. Um, I remember at a certain time for myself where I personally had to stay over um, with the patient um, because um, I did not want him to die alone. Um, and my staff members have done the exact same thing. Like they don't, we don't want these patients to die alone. And uh, for them to make those phone calls to the patient's families and just let them know like your, um, your loved one didn't die alone, um, I think makes all the difference. Um, so I actually had an experience where, and this was prior to vaccine, um, vaccines, um, just speaking to the emotional toll that this is based on um, nurses. Um, we had a pod of four COVID patients um, and they all transitioned within hours of each other. Um, so imagine the toll that plays on a nurse, um, four rounds of postmortem care, four families no longer able to see their loved ones, and then four virtual funerals where the loved ones aren't able to say goodbye physically to their family member. <clears throat> um, and I personally had an aunt who was a head nurse in New Jersey that passed away from COVID when she was battling on the front line. So it's a little personal for me. Um, so then um, we had the introduction of vaccines, um, and we actually saw this as a positive sign of hope. Um, to the profession until the numbers um, start to go back up again uh, with the rise of the Delta variant. Um, and they caused a strain on nursing inside and outside the walls of the hospital. Um, so I can, my staff, what they're going through right now is unreal. Um, um, a lot of them have kids um, and it's already hard enough raising a kid. Now they have to worry about their child bringing home a virus um, because someone won't wear a mask um, and they're spreading, spreading this illness. Um, so just think one child takes home, uh, takes, can take a nurse out um, and that, um, that actually it doesn't help the community because you have that one less nurse that can take care of that patient that comes in with a heart attack or a stroke and then they're left in the waiting room for hours, days, um, waiting to be seen to get an inpatient bed um, and we're fighting this war of the unvaccinated right now. Um, so these patients like this, they are, it's much longer right now. They're a lot younger. Um, there's treatment out there for them. Um, so it's actually clogging up the patient flow and putting a strain on the nurses right now. Um, and this added stress to the staff, um, especially led to the staff leaving the organization. Um, and of course, less nurses equals higher ratios for the staff. So that's an added strain on them as well. Um, so as a leader, um, I've personally been out the weeds to help ensure my staff feel supported at times, but sometimes I feel like I'm not enough. I'm gonna feel guilty for even going in my office and closing the door just to finish up a certain task to keep the unit running um, because they're working with higher ratios right now. The acuity is higher. It's just, it's tough on them right now. Um, so with the mounting pressure of less staff, more demand and the emotional burnout, um, I feel like we're getting to a level of urgency where we can't meet the needs of our community without their help. Um, so I feel like as a profession, uh, we just respectfully ask that our community either get vaccinated or at the very least wear a mask um, to help us tackle this virus. All right, thank you, Dexter. We really appreciate that insight. And I'm sure you all are experiencing as other hospitals, you're continuing to see attrition. And as we see people leave and ask why they're leaving, a lot of it is related back to the pandemic and things that they're suffering through relative to the pandemic. And a lot we hear are leaving nursing altogether, which is even a sadder statement. So once again, thank you for that commentary. Next, we're gonna hear from Ashley Apple from Central Virginia. Ashley, you're up. Uh, so good morning, my name is Ashley Apple. I've been a registered nurse for 12 years. I worked in the emergency department for over a decade. Um, I have the unique perspective of having worked for the first part of the pandemic in the ER and then transitioning to my role as a family nurse practitioner um, in pediatric urgent care. I have a doctorate in my field and I'm also a clinical nursing instructor at UVA. Um, it's an honor to be here with you today and I truly appreciate your help in amplifying the voices of Virginia nurses because we need your help. Um, nursing is a hard job. We work 10 to 12 hour shifts. We work evenings, holidays, weekends. We care not just for the sick and dying, but also for their families. And we navigate all of the complicated family dynamics that arise when a loved one is ill. It's the nature of our job, but we proudly show up to serve our communities. But COVID is different. We started this pandemic with inadequate personal protective equipment, reusing gear over and over that was intended for single use. We placed our health and our well being at risk to care for our community, and we worried constantly that we might bring COVID home to our children and to our families. We physically isolated ourselves from our support systems for fear that we might get them sick, and we worked overtime to help manage the endless flow of patients who needed care. 
We held the hands of our patients so they didn't have to die alone. We're now 18 months into this crisis and nurses are caring for the sickest patients we've ever seen in our careers day after day with no end in sight. We're seeing massive volumes of patients that are stretching our resources thin and it causes significant moral distress for nurses when we can't provide the level of care that our patients deserve. Through the course of this pandemic, I've cared for patients, COVID patients from two weeks old to 90 years old. And although the prognosis is quite different between these two age groups, remaining hopeful is extremely hard. Imagine the worst day you've ever had at work, then add human suffering, death, personal risk, and repeat it every day for 18 months. This is what nurses are going through. We are not soldiers, we're caretakers, but we found ourselves on a battlefield with no end in sight, and we are hemorrhaging nurses from the bedside as a result. If we fail to address the burnout, depression, and PTSD among nurses, the consequences threaten to destabilize healthcare infrastructure in the Commonwealth and the nation. Mm -hmm. We're strategizing ways to address the nursing shortage, but it's going to take time. We need help from the public to slow the spread of COVID and reduce the extreme burdens on healthcare facilities and nurses. We need the public to get vaccinated, to wear a mask, to make responsible decisions about their health. We need help from state and federal government uh, to help nurses cope with the extreme stress they've endured and continue to endure every single day. Inaction is not an option. Thanks for this opportunity and I'm happy to answer any questions you have in just a bit. All right, thank you for that, Ashley. You know, and I can only say I've been a, in healthcare for a period of now 36 years. This is the most challenging time that I've experienced during um, my career as a nurse. And it really makes my heart bleed and hurt for the suffering that nurses are going through as well as our patients um, during the time of this pandemic. Next, we're gonna hear from Misha Jones. So Misha, you're up next. And she is from the Charlottesville, Abermoral area. Thank you, Linda. Um, and thank you for everyone for um, sharing your story. Can y'all hear me okay? We can. Um, so our nurses are mentally, physically, and emotionally exhausted. Um, We've been on the front line of this pandemic for over 18 months now. I've lost how many months? And a, a lot of us are thinking, what are we going to look like when this is all over with? Wh what, what am I going to have left to give to myself, to my families, to the profession that I love so much? Um, and it doesn't look good for some of us because we, we keep asking, what is our why? Why do we keep doing this? We, we were rated the number one trusting profession and no one's trusting us or taking care of us. And so we're losing faith, not in our other nursing colleagues, but in the people who are supposed to care for us. Um, and we, we're doing our best to take care of our other nursing colleagues. We're doing the best that we can. I've had colleagues come up to me and say, Misha, I can't do this anymore. I can't take care of these patients. I love being a nurse. I love being a critical care nurse. But this pandemic has me crying before I walk through the doors. And I don't know what to do anymore. Um, I can't sleep. I can't eat. I can't talk about it. I'm afraid. When the pandemic started, I had deployed to the bedside. I'm afraid that I'm going to get my kids sick, my family sick. And so I locked myself in a bedroom. I'd get undressed in my basement, throw my clothes, and then I'd shower and lock myself in the bedroom until it's time for me to go to work the next day. And my family would talk to me through the door. We, we can't keep doing this. At, at the front of, we've been the front line of this pandemic for the last 18 months. And what we're asking the community to do now is for you to be the front line, for you to take care of us. We're, we will take care of you when you come in the hospital, but we're asking you to do your part and take care of us in your communities. And what that looks like is wearing a mask, get vaccinated, wash your hands. We'll get through this, but we need to, it's going to take a village. It's going to take a village. Um, and we have our village strong, but we need you to come join our village um, because we can't do this alone anymore. Thank you. Excellent points, Misha. Thank you. Thanks you to everyone this, today on the call that, you know, has spoken. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Jemison to see if we have any questions from our media and I will have her actually help us navigate through those questions. Sure. 
Um, so if you have a question, you can either put it in the chat or raise your hand um, on Zoom. And if you're directing it to a specific um, nurse who's joined us today, please um, let me know. Jackie Tafusco, you can go first. Hey, thank you all so much for doing this and thanks for everything you've done during this pandemic. Um, I was wondering in general, if you guys have any statistics um, that reflect the scope of the staff shortage among nurses in Virginia specifically? You know, and I can speak to that. So this is Linda. Um, I know that we do for our specific hospitals. I don't know that we've seen anything collective wise. And I can only say anecdotally, as I sit on these calls, either with the VNA group, CNO groups from across the, the Commonwealth or VHHA meetings, um, all I do recognize is that there's a constant trend upward. And that is more anecdotal than anything, but we're all feeling it within our facilities. I would also add that, um, you know, uh, it's sort of an adequate number of nursing staff it depends on the number of patients flowing through the doors. Right. Uh, we can only care for so many people. And so this is something that changes in real time um, as far as how many nurses are needed at any given facility in order to meet patient needs. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a difficult thing to, to put a number on to quantify the shortage. It depends, you know, if you've got 300 patients walking through your door or you've got 50. Um, and so, you know, we need to have enough nurses to be able to flex to meet the needs of the public. Excellent point. Thank you for that, Ashley. Um, Kate Masters, you can go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, you know, in, in relation to the shortage, a lot of comments that I've noticed under articles that are kind of talking about what nurses are, are going through are people who say that they think the shortages are linked to vaccine mandates in the workplace, and that's why some nurses are, are leaving. Can anyone talk to, you know, whether that's true and whether, you know, those mandates have any role in, you know, attrition that we're seeing now? Uh, so, um, go ahead. Well, I would say, you know, speaking at Virginia Hospital Center, um, I know unequivocally that that has not been the case. Uh, we are uh, requiring an attestation, uh, but we have not yet uh, made the decision to require vaccination for our healthcare workers. Um, our vaccination rate um, is 87% uh, for the hospital, over 90% for nursing. And... Um, but our rate of turnover, um, even for first year students, I mean, keep in mind that, that these new these nurses that are approaching that first year, as as was mentioned earlier, they they've only known a life in COVID, and the level of acuity has dramatically changed. The patient, there are a lot of patients who, you know, a year and a half ago would have been at IC level of care, are now sitting on the floor. And so, you know, that's so stressful. That load that these nurses are bearing is so heavy. Um, you know, let's, let's not mix words about this. It has absolutely nothing to do with the vaccine mandate. Those nurses that are deciding, uh, you know, if that's their organization's decision to leave, then they're making that decision and they'll find a job somewhere. Uh, but uh, it is really because of all these other factors that we've been talking about today that is leading to the nurse turnover that we're seeing. And I would only say, this is Linda, as the VNA president, that we do support the statement by the ANA. So I would reference it, reference you to that statement relative to, to vaccine and vaccine mandates. And I can provide that to everyone and I'll follow up that I'll send to um, the press that's joined us today. Jackie, did you have a follow-up question? Um, sort of. I, so I guess I wonder because, you know, when you look at, I know earlier in the pandemic, in, in Virginia in particular, we were talking about the demand and the burden put on hospitals. And it seemed to be the case that it wasn't so much the sheer number of beds. You know, when you look at the dashboard from the VHHA, it still shows there's more, you know, enough, it seems that there's enough beds available, at least, you know, me not having stepped in the door, but um, do you still feel like the biggest problem has to do with just like staff being stretched thin and not being able to take care of more patients rather than the actual lack of physical beds or does it depend on the region? So, and this is Linda again, and I'll offer anyone else the opportunity to answer this as though there is physical bed space 
there are not nurses to take care of people in those spaces. And so although there may be look like that there are beds available, once again, it goes back to the staff that we have to be able to care for them. So I know in our own facility, we have had to close wings and I'm familiar with this with other organizations too throughout the state because they have not had the nursing personnel to provide the care they needed to those patients. I think when uh, people, individuals get confused, thinking a nurse is a nurse and that nurse can work yeah. anywhere, that's not the case. An ICU nurse is trained to take, criti take care of critically ill patients. Uh, acute care nurse is trained to take care of acute care patients. They're, you have to have specialty training to take care of the critical care patients. Thank you, Misha. And is it fair to say that there is some regional variation? I, I, I see that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you all are saying that that's pretty much true across the board in Virginia. The staff, the staff is stretched thin and that's impacting patient care. Um, are there certain areas of Virginia where you're observing that that is more severe? You know, and I, I can only speak to the region that I'm from. So we're in the southwestern part of Virginia. And so the more, I think the rural areas are being heavily impacted by this. And a lot of that is related to, once again, the vaccine, how many people have received vaccines versus those that have not. So your vaccination rates typically will correlate if you look at any other data relative to what what's happening in a lot of areas. And, you know, so I'm a different part of the state, a uh, different state of, of COVID infection, although, you know, 30 patients, if I, you know, didn't have 30 COVID patients, it would fix my capacity problem. But, you know, we have 437 licensed beds. I think it was uh, last week we hit a new high record. We had 487 patients in the hospital. anybody else want to share from a different region? All right. Um, Kate, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, my follow-up was just, you know, you, you mentioned that given sort of what we're seeing right now, it would be great to have, you know, some state and federal help. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are any specific actions that you'd like to see specifically at the state level to kind of help address what, what you all are experiencing. And so this, this is Linda. So today we're really not focusing on that. There are some other things that the VNA is working on. Um, and so right now I'm not going to get into those discussions because it deals with other partnerships, et cetera. But um, those are important aspects and they, they will be addressed. Monique, I believe you have your hand raised. You can go ahead. Hi, I'm Monique Lello. I'm a health reporter up in the Stanton, Augusta County area for the USA Today Network. First, I want to say thank you to all of you for having the courage to be so vulnerable with us. Um, and I don't know if this is so much uh, of a question or as advice. I live in a county where uh, the very people that you're speaking about, I see every day, in fact, they're very, they're so vocal about being anti-maskers that even the people in positions, officials, uh, school board members will be vocal about it. And it shows we have some of the highest infection rates in the entire state. So what I guess what I'm asking is, I can't seem to make a dent. And I really want to because I've been trying to do it for a year and a half. I can share all that you're going through, but what can I say to get them to even consider it, to even read it? It's almost like they don't even want to look. And I really want to, I, I want to get through to this county. I don't know if you can answer that, but I'm listening. So Monique, I appreciate that commentary. 
Um, and you know, that's pretty much why we're here today. I think everybody on this call, I'm not gonna speak for them, but I just have the feeling that, you know, we as nurses are exemplary tired. I mean, just extremely tired, exhausted, as Misha said. And so we have made these conversations or had these conversations with our public before. We have pleaded with them to wear a mask. We have pleaded with about vaccines. And I don't know what it's gonna take. And sometimes I see within my own facility, it, until someone has a personal experience with someone passing with COVID, sometimes this just does not hit home. We had a patient in our ICU and I was over making rounds there one day and had a family member come just flying through there. And she was just, you know, she was hollering, you know, I can't believe my mom is going to die of COVID. I can't believe my mom is going to die of COVID. And it is not a reality to a lot of these people. And how we can get that message across more succinctly, I'm not really sure, um, other than doing what we're doing. And I'd be open. I, I'd like to hear what the others on the panel have to say. And I... I, I agree. I am. Um, I haven't lost hope in people yet. <laughs> I haven't lost hope. And if it, and I, I've come to realize that sometimes I can't get my point across in a group, but if I could just reach that one person, that one person, and, and that's what I shoot for every day, just one person. Um, and I may do that when I'm volunteering to do COVID testing and just talking to someone and ask, are you vaccinated? And, and just to understand why and help them get, get information because they don't have the information. So my goal is just to reach one person and maybe that one person will reach someone else. And um, it's, it'll be like a domino effect. I, I still have faith that we're going to get through this. I don't know what we're going to look like, but I still have faith. Yeah, I, I would just echo that, you know, it's, it's, it's having these kind of non-threatening dialogues that, you know, I was um, getting, uh, getting my hair done uh, a few weeks ago, and I was speaking to my hairdresser, we have a great relationship, and um, she's, of course, wearing a mask, and, and um, you know, I, we had talked enough leading up to the vaccines even being released that, you know, I felt like, you know, she wasn't anti-vax. But she did share that she um, had one of her clients who had been really offended that she hadn't got the vaccine. And so I, you know, I asked her, I said, so, you know, let, let's be real. So, you know, can you just share with me, you know, why, why you haven't gotten the vaccine? And she said, you know, she said, I just haven't gotten around to it. She said, now, so I say this to you. She said, I realize that I have this big vacation coming up in Florida. She's going to take her two-year-old down to Florida. She said, you know what an idiot I would feel like if I went down to Florida and I caught COVID and I end up in the hospital? And I said, yeah. I said, you can die. I mean, some of the sickest patients that I've seen in this pandemic have been pregnant women in the prime of their life at what should be the happiest moment and they're in the ICU or worse yet, getting shipped out of town so they can be put on ECMO, which is, I mean, the sick of the sick, that's heart lung bypass. And being told, you can plan on her being in this state for at least the next six weeks. Let's hope that we can save the baby. I mean, that's reality. And I understand what you're saying, Monique, about trying to break through the clutter. And it's it's so frustrating. And Melody, you're talking about children. And one of the things I always think is, if for no other reason, if you won't get a vaccine for yourself, why would you not get it for all of the children out there and wear a mask? Because as we know, we can transmit the Delta variant even if we've been vaccinated. Why would you not protect children? And I don't know, I don't know. Again, Misha, it's like you said, I hope that maybe one person says, oh, okay, I get it and I should do it for children. So, because they're, they're vulnerable and they can't get the vaccination. But for 18 years in a row, nurses have been voted the most trusted professionals, a Gallup organization poll, not just healthcare professionals, but of all professions, nurses are voted the most trusted. So you can only imagine how frustrating this has to be for nurses who have always been so trusted, but yet can't get 
the community to listen to them and to hear what they are seeing every day, what works and what doesn't. You know, they are treading water and they've been treading water for so long and it's not sustainable. Um, you know, we need to throw them a lifeline and, and here's the thing, the public can. You could be kind and that's one great point because there is more hostility. But the biggest lifeline you can throw is by getting vaccinated or, and wearing a mask. And, you know, they're just, nurses are, they can't keep treading. We're losing more and more nurses. And they're just throwing up their arm and asking for a life preserver and the public can provide it. Thanks, Janet. Thanks. Um, go ahead. Um, I would like to say uh, something to that. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I have um, been in this critical care and out in the public and I wear masks when I'm out. And all this time, a year and a half, I have never gotten COVID. And my husband and my two children have also not gotten COVID. And that's because we, before the vaccine, we were wearing masks and sanitizing and we were really careful with that. We still went out, we had to go to the stores. We occasionally would go to a restaurant, uh, but we were very, very careful. We made sure we were physically distanced, but just wearing masks and then getting the vaccine and none of my family has got it, gotten COVID. And we've all been swabbed many times just to make sure if we had allergies or something. So if I could speak to anything is to say wearing masks obviously works um, because I've been in the thick of it and also coming home to my families and, you know, what I'm doing apparently has been a good job. So it, we could all do that if we are careful and wear masks. Thank you, Elise. Thanks. And we have um, one more, we can take one more question. Um, this is from Stephanie Harris. Her mic is not working, so I'm gonna ask it on her behalf. Um, do you have any statistics on nurse suicide since the pandemic or statistics on the number of nurses seeking mental health, mental health help? We don't. Um, and, and so once again, because these are, you know, it, it's difficult, it's not, information that's reported. Right. And so we're not going to be able to have those statistics. Um, we hear about them through the stories. There's legislation that's on, you know, actually being passed relative to a physician that committed suicide that was working. Actually, the physician was from Charlottesville. And so we know that it's out there. We hear it. Um, but to say statistically, can we put a number with that? No. And I don't have the number, but I know that nurse suicides are up. We know that depression is up across the country okay. among the general public. We know that even more so among nurses. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's very challenging. Well, and, and the stigma still exists, right? right? You know, that, you know, if you're a, if you're a real nurse, that none of this is going to bother you, that you're somehow going to be tough enough and you have the willpower to get through this and not need any help. And so, you know, I know in our system, we've outsourced our, our uh, 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 employee assistance program to try to give people a safe space so that you know, even though you can never see it in your medical record, unless, you know, it was you looking for it, we want to make sure that, you know, we separate the two, uh, just people so people don't worry about their privacy and hopefully will seek help. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see when we bring... Um, you know, our employee assistance to the nurses, you know, when one nurse starts to open up, then it just, you know, just pours out of the nurses. And so many times you'll hear, you know, gosh, you know, to know that I'm not the only one struggling with this. Um, you know, the challenge is, is, you know, with all these other factors we've been talking about trying to reach all these nurses. Uh, but, you know, the stigma is real and uh, it's something we continue to try to work through and work past. But, um, you know, I think from a public reporting standpoint, I don't know that we'll ever get real numbers. And the, honestly, the easier question might be of all of the nurses who have been working on the COVID front lines, how many have not suffered significant emotional, physical distress? Mm -hmm. and 
just to follow up with that, I do have two studies that were done that I'll send out to everyone that was here today um, that have some, not statistics specific to um, nurse suicide, but mental health surveys um, that were done by two different organizations. So I can send those out when I send out the um, recording and the list of attendees. And I, I pulled some stats that might be helpful. I'll, I'll put that as, on the cover sheet. So there we do, we don't have, specific stats related to Virginia, but there are some on just general nurse mental health right now that we can provide you. And every time a, a new variant is introduced, uh, it just escalates exponentially. So it's a, gonna, a moving number. Go ahead, no, go ahead. I'm sorry, Janet. I, you know, I'm just gonna tag on what Melody said. You know, We see nurses and we've had mental health services come in to try to work with nurses, but it is that stigma. And so people don't wanna self-report. And I, I know that you can remember this, but we had a conference really talking about mental health. And it was so interesting. One person came forward and shared their mental health story and everybody in the room had a story to share. And it was so powerful because people were suffering alone because they didn't feel like it was quote unquote, okay to share that and to be vulnerable as a nurse. And I would like to add, I actually do have just a small little snippet of data. So there's an ongoing study in Central Virginia. It was a 586 bedside nurses, LPNs, and CNAs uh, working during COVID. And among those, um, I think it was about, we'll see, about one in four uh, reported um, sustained, feeling symptoms of sustained trauma, uh, negative changes to their emotions, energy levels, uh, sleep patterns, and how they perceive their personal lives. Um, and importantly, of those, um, let's see, 72% said that um, they had yet to try any intervention to try to help. And I don't know that we know the exact reason for that, but I think we could all probably guess <laughs> the reason. Um, you know, who's got time for that when you're working overtime hours, uh, trying to care for your family and trying to just get by day to day, uh, but also the stigma that's associated with um, seeking, you know, mental health help when it's needed. Um, but uh, the, like I said, the study is ongoing. I think there will be more data to come out of that. Um, that data was provided by Tiffany Little. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't tell you the organization, but I'll look it up and I can get that to you if you need it. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, especially to all the nurses um, that were here and to the press that has joined us. I will send a follow-up with the recording, um, the data we talked about, a list of all the nurses um, with their employers or their VNA role um, to your email. We'll get that out to you as soon as we can because I know some of you are working on a deadline. So we should turn that around pretty quickly. Um, and y'all y'all um, have my phone number and email if you have any questions that arise. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.